Hello listeners, welcome to Film Fanatics. We are three film geeks celebrating one year of discussing movies both new and old. My name is Justin. I'm Joe. My name's Dan. This week, Jeff Bridges and Meryl Streep help adapt a classic book, The Giver. Two new girl stars play dress up in Let's Be Cops, and a pair of scientists look for a matching pair of eyes in Eye Origins. We'll also review Step Up All In, and sadly, one of Robin Williams' final performances in our home media moment, Speaking of which, our top five this week will look back at our mini so tribute to Robin Williams and go a little bit more in-depth into some of his greatest roles. Our triple feature of older films is new classic The Bourne Legacy, old classic Sin City, and Oscar-nominated film Amistad. And this is, as Justin said, the one-year anniversary of Film Fanatic, so uh, we definitely want to thank all of our listeners for uh, being with us, a lot of them from the beginning, uh, and our subscribers, which uh, keeps growing every week it seems so that's awesome i definitely want to thank all of you for uh, listening and reaching out to us with your comments and your old classics Uh, joe anything to add absolutely it's just really awesome Uh, amazing how fast time goes by actually we've come a long way to believe just uh, thinking about some of our first episodes we were really rough and just getting the format down but i think we've done a lot of good stuff here and uh i know for a fact a lot of people do enjoy our stuff and uh, hey as long as you guys keep trying to keep engaged i mean we're going to keep bringing more movies so please yeah. Listen, spread the word. Absolutely. And uh, more minisodes, too, coming uh, this year. Mm-hmm. To a YouTube near you. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, well, listen, we've got a big docket this week um, of many, many new releases. And uh, as Justin said, we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, Robin Williams passing with our top five. Uh, but first up is The Giver. And Joe's going to tell us about that. The film adaptation of the award-winning dystopian children's novel written by Lewis Lowry. It was directed by Philip Noyce, and it stars Jeff Bridges, Meryl Streep, and Brenton Thwaites. The story follows the basic plot of the book fairly closely. Set up in an isolated community after a great war of some kind, the society has suppressed any emotion and has severely limited ideas such as free will and imagination. All knowledge of the old world is suppressed, even color. However, as a precaution, each generation... Uh, From each generation, one is chosen to hold these memories and advise the village elders. Jonas, played by Thwaites, is chosen to be the receiver and begins to learn by taking lessons from the giver, played by Jeff Bridges. However, as he begins to learn about how much knowledge has been kept from his people, he begins to question his society and see the flaws of his seemingly perfect world. The Giver is considered to be one of the most thought-provoking children novels of the 1990s and has had a profound effect on many young readers from that time. It takes classic science fiction and social issues and told them in a simplified but functional way. The film does capture the spirit of the book and is mostly faithful. There is some gorgeous cinematography which helps to amplify the power of emotion and the story's most basic themes, particularly when Jonas and the Giver are having their exchanges, which are probably some of the best scenes of the movie. So, while it is essentially a fine film, it does feel slightly underdeveloped and I can imagine the simplified nature of the story and lack of action may leave younger viewers or those less familiar with the material underwhelmed. The acting is decent for the most part, with the possible exception of Katie Holmes, who just seems to be trying too hard, Mm. and I'm not really a fan of her generally. The film also does drag a bit after the third act, one of the disadvantages of a less action-based climax. The Giver is a good adaption, but it does feel a bit on the generic side, still held up by decent acting and stylistic elements, which do help enforce the plot of the novel, and I give it a B-. Well, yeah, Joe, I can totally see why the people behind the movie were suggesting that filmgoers read the book before coming to the film. The shorter runtime than most young adult adaptions does not really allow for full comprehension of everything going on in the society and why. And they must have realized that after seeing the final cut. I definitely felt it. I'm the one of the three of us that did not get to read the book ahead of time. Joe, you're much more familiar with the story. Justin just uh, read it shortly before the movie, so Mm. you guys at least had that knowledge. I mean, I really liked the ideas that they were presenting, and I loved the dynamic between Thwaites and Bridges. Those were some of the strongest scenes of the film, obviously. Um, I loved the gradual shift to color and sometimes going back to black and white or in between. It's kind of reminiscent of uh, another film we'll be talking about later. Actually, yes, that's that's true. Um, There's... Another film coming up in our triple feature with that has some 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 color in it, but is mainly presented in black and white. I really like the story as well overall, but I have to say the lack of some explanations lowered my overall enjoyment of the film. But still, it is solid, and 
it makes me want to read the source material, so that's good. Good. Um, so I'm going to leave The Giver with a B. Nice. I enjoyed it. Uh, Katie Holmes is terrible. She was the worst Always. part of the movie. Yeah, she really was. I wish they had anyone else in there. But, I mean, Meryl Streep did a good job. Yeah. Um, and Sarsgaard, uh, as yeah. the, the dad, he was, you know, he did what the role called for. I thought the uh, other supporting actors, the teenagers, were fine. Yeah, the other kids that I didn't really know. Um, I think it was funny that they have Taylor Swift's name on the poster because she's in, like, one scene. Mm-hmm. <laughs> She's, well, she's a cam, a glorified cameo. She's barely even in the scene. Though it's funny, the person I saw the movie with was like, "Wow, that's Taylor Swift." So I mean, I guess it got some people interested. Apparently, she was a big fan of the book, and that's why she wanted uh, to be a part. Okay, there were a lot of people behind the project that really wanted to get this done. So mm. that was kind of cool. It's yeah. made mostly by fans, including a uh, uh, Jeff Bridges was one of the main people behind it. Oh, cool! So, wow, yeah, he really, really was pushing to get this movie made. Well, he he turned out a great performance in it. So. Yeah, I, I really liked him a lot. He was perfect as the giver. Yeah. He was one of the best things about is he, it. When you read the book, is that sort of the, the figure that you pictured? A little bit, actually. I, I mean, the famous cover actually has a more grizzled beard, but he yeah. really did seem like, uh, in the character, he really did capture that that mystery of him. Okay. Just that, that old mentor figure. And uh, Bridge is just so dynamic anyway, but he did it. He's probably, in terms of an adaptation, he's one of the truest, I think, from it. Justin, let's go to you on The Giver. In one of my favorite moments in Sin City, the film shifts from, from the perspective of one character to an entirely different one for a few minutes. In voiceover, he explains that he firmly believes that the protagonist of the given segment was given the disservice of living in the wrong time period and will be right at home at several other points where he would gladly be accepted. That may seem like an awkward way to kick off a review about The Giver, but it's honestly how I feel about the film adaptation. While groundbreaking in 1993 and inspired in numerous young adult, young adult novels following it, the film adaptation of The Giver just comes off as predictable and generic, despite earlier influence. Granted, this is no fault of Bridges as the wise man himself or Meryl Streep, but rather in the narrative. It seems rather ironic that a film that had a campaign urging audiences to read the book ahead of time takes so many liberties with the source material. Sequences happen differently, characters change in very dramatic ways, and the ending is heavily altered. Admittedly, not all of this is bad, But as I've mentioned many times on the show, the point of an adaptation includes figuring out what will and will not translate to to screen, and it's not a balance anyone involved with the project had a firm grasp of, and I give it a C-. minus. Again, you had just read this, you know, shortly before seeing the movie. Did you feel that if you had not read it, it would have played as more confusing? Like, I, I was a bit confused by it? I think it's a lot more confusing if you haven't read the book. Okay. Hmm. Joe, would you agree with that? Um, I mean, I thought it was capturing the spirit of the story. There were definitely were some changes, but to be fair, I read it in fourth grade. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> right. Well, yeah, that's that's why I, I thought it was a good question to pose to Justin because it's a little fresher in his mind. Mm-hmm. Um, it is interesting that the ending is different, though. I, I'm curious now even more so to, to read the book uh, to see how it ends. The book is better. I could definitely the book say is that. Okay. infinitely better. That but, doesn't surprise me. But, you know... It, I mean, the same I general thing kind of happens, but it plays out much differently. I don't think audiences would have been okay with the way the book ends. Yeah. But I also feel like the movie's ending is just weird and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's kind of hard to give it away, but basically it's more metaphorical in a sense. Uh, yeah, and that's okay. probably the best way to say it without okay. giving spoilers. So maybe a little rough to translate to screen? It, yes. In all honesty, that's that's part of the problem. And I mean, I can I can kind of see where Justin's coming from. Like, there were something... The book is... It's weird because it's, it's very simplified, but it does have a lot of very abstract ideas, and some of it's written very abstractly because it okay. was about emotion mm-hmm. and that emotional connection. So... That's why I'd imagine some scenes, some parts of the movie are difficult to translate. That's why it comes off as being a bit generic and safe, mm-hmm. because it might have really gone over people's heads, some of the choices otherwise. So I kind of understand why they decided to alter some things. Did everything make sense in the book? Yes. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Because I didn't quite understand, like, at one point the receiver goes missing and they don't seem to know what happened to him, but it's like there's cameras everywhere, and yes... They end up, like, looking it at some different camera angles to see, okay, where was he all day today? But I feel like there were signs that something was amiss. I felt like they would have been watching him closer. You'd think. Right? Well, they were confused people. I guess so. 
And as such, I was a confused audience member yeah, I can, watching I can, it. I can understand that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I definitely enjoyed the the cinematography was great. Mm-hmm. So it was, it oh, was yeah. a treat to look at. Um, and I did enjoy, you know, the ideas being conveyed. They definitely didn't explain as much as they did in the book. Right. Like they, they kind of, they touched the surface of things, but uh, they, they, I don't know. Maybe they didn't feel like an audience would be able to handle it. I don't But what's funny is, like, you look at all of the, the popular book adaptations and they're all more than two hours hunger games is almost two and a half each one divergent was like straight two. this is not even an hour and 40 minutes mm-hmm. they could have given us another five to ten minutes and fleshed out a couple of these things a little bit they honestly oh, yeah. could have uh, you know? stretched out they, they could have definitely expanded on things i mean i don't know if it necessarily would have been like an epic but they could have right. they could have expanded on some details explained more of the background for people the thing is, though, um, really, there's some different themes that are explored in the other books. Too. Oh, yeah. so there, I didn't realize there were many books. There, there are actually okay. more books. Uh, there, only one of them is like a direct sequel, mm-hmm. but they actually do explain more about the world outside of this community. Mm, but it's the thing about the author's works is her stuff is more thematic in its connections okay not necessarily plot wise right so it's more like a, an association of related ideas okay so does it even involve the same characters mm, the, fourth, the fourth one yeah. the fourth one yes okay um well this one had a, a fairly tepid response at the box office with uh almost 13 million in its opening weekend it opened at number five so it's weird i don't know if any of those other books uh, we'll ever get to see on screen or not well i mean reviews weren't that great i mean we live in a world where Hunger Games is out, Divergent is out, and even though The Giver obviously started a whole lot of the dystopian themes that have been prevalent in, in modern day uh, young adult literature, it still will come out as an adaptation looking kind of generic and ri- almost, and probably people are going to make the statement that it's ripping off those things. That's mm-hmm. what I thought, and I even told Dan that before he went in, like, just don't go in with that attitude, because yeah, I think yeah. I think a lot of people are. It does look like it's ripping off Divergent well, Hunger and Hunger Games you know, when it's kind of the other way around. And what's funny is, you mentioned Hunger Games specifically. For me, it felt more like Divergent mm-hmm. while I was watching it, especially with the, the whole ceremony there at the beginning. And the dividing and of the... And the dividing of the, the different people. Yeah. And, but yeah, I mean, armed with the knowledge that yes, this came out 15 years before the Hunger Games books did, mm. yeah. um, you know, that sort of and that's put what bugs into me perspective. That, I wish that this movie had uh, the level of time, and I mean, it had the talent, mm-hmm. it had the talent, but it didn't have quite the budget. So I mean, if it had the budget, if it had the, the length of Hunger Games or Divergent, I think it could have been just as good, maybe better. Yeah. Like, I saw yeah. a lot of potential for it to really emulate it but at the there same time there was some bad cgi in it speaking of the budget yeah yeah and the they're the, and like the soldiers i mean they were just guys on motorcycles right they're just like eh, i don't know all right well let's move on our next movie is let's be cops and in this jake johnson and damon wayne jr play ryan and justin two 30 year old best friends who are at a standstill in their lives When they go to a party dressed as cops and get mistaken for the real deal, they decide to have a little fun with it. So much fun, they decide to continue it into the next day and the next until being fake police officers is just who they are. Ryan buys a cop car off eBay, they start responding to calls, etc. when they get caught up in a serious tangle with the Russian mafia. Nina Dobrev co-stars as Justin's love interest, Rob Riggle from the Jump Street films is an actual cop that falls for Ryan and Justin's gag, and the great Andy Garcia co-stars as well. The best thing Let's Be Cops has going for it is the chemistry between Johnson and Wayans Jr. The two are currently co-starring on Fox's New Girl, but that happened after they shot the film. They didn't know each other too well before making this movie, which is kind of surprising because they really are great together, if only the material were better. It actually starts out fairly promising and funny, sometimes very frequently, and then it gets bogged down with cliches and lazy jokes in the middle, and then picks up again at the end, but in a more dark, less funny way, and it becomes very predictable. It's also about 15 minutes longer than it needs to be. But that all said, it's shades better than the last few summer comedies we reviewed, Sex Tape and Tammy, so for that, Let's, get, Let's Be Cops gets a C-. minus. Justin, hmm. let's go to you. Let's Be Cops is a film that basically plays out like an SNL sketch turned feature, but the bulk of that depends on how willing the audience is able to suspend disbelief. I can't honestly say that Let's Be Cops had me laughing at every turn, but there are a few instances throughout the film where I honestly did give a hearty chuckle. 
That said, much of the humor is very erratic, and mostly throws everything at the screen fast and loose, in more ways than one might think. As a result, it's largely scattershot, but fortunately, thanks to a decent cast that has good comedic timing, such as Rob Riggle, this only gets occasionally cringe-inducing. As a whole, I can't really recommend Let's Be Cops, but in a year filled with comedies like this that have been so much worse, I can't really say avoid it either, and I give it a C- minus as well. Yeah, like, I feel like this is one of those movies that, upon repeat viewings, you could see people actually, like, quoting some of the lines. Like, it's that kind oh, yeah. of a movie, yeah. you know? I don't think it's that well made, but it does have some funny moments, and the two leads, you know, are great together, and Rob Riggle adds a lot, too. Uh, Joe, what do you think of Let's Be Cops? It made me laugh a couple times. Um, I think the biggest problem I had was I didn't really like the main characters that much. The gag was okay, but it just started to go way beyond sense. You really had to suspend a lot of disbelief <laughs> uh, as the movie went on. Mm. And then, you kind of mentioned this before, Dan, towards the end, its tone shifts dramatically into like this almost this crime thriller. And uh, I'm not sure whether that was intended or not, but overall, it was pretty dumb, forgettable, but there were some laughs, and I give it a D+. Plus. Yeah, the end, it was like, they almost stopped doing the jokes, too. Like, it was, it wasn't, like, we're the Millers, let's say, for example, because that's, that has sort of a dark undertone to it. There's people after them. The laughs still came, though, even in those scenes. Here, it was a lot of, like, gunplay and, like, you know, hiding from these mafia members and getting caught and but it wasn't, it wasn't that funny. No, no, it was like, oh, God. Nor yeah, was it even played for laughs. No, it was serious. You know? It was a straight-up serious movie right. for about 20 minutes. <laughs> right. Which it didn't need to be. No. You know? The Mafia stuff was but pretty I mean, cool, though. Think about that. Well, yes, any movie with the Mafia, I know, gets gets a higher grade from you. <laughs> and Andy Garcia, too. But this is the thing. Like, once again, that, that twist... With him there, there's like a twist with Andy Garcia. Mm. That scene was like not funny. That was no, like, it was like it, just, at it, all. it became like straight serious investigation. Mm-hmm. But you're like, but it's with this guy. It's a comedy, right? So it was just a very confused ride. But I mean, to to make a counterpoint, think about Beverly Hills Cop for a second. At least with the first one, there's there was this big, big, crazy shootout at the end of it, and that scene was still pretty serious. And I mean, there's still some dark undertones within the first one at least i mean the second one got a little bit more more tongue-in-cheek but it's more balanced than this was though agreed but i'm saying i'm not saying you can't have a movie that goes dark but you have to at least segue it better yeah yeah, like segue it better yeah this one is it's like turns on a dime almost and literally it it, it almost abandons the comedy completely for segments Mm -hmm. like completely even though the situations got dark in Beverly Hills Cop, he was always rolling with it, like, trying right. to be funny. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like, make cracking jokes. Yes, okay, they're going to kill him, but he's still playing his guy. And the other thing is, since he was an actual cop, Axel Foley, you could sort of see, okay, well, this might happen. But like Joe said, it's like the suspension of disbelief factor keeps going up as the movie goes on, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden, it's dark. And, and you're like, like okay, but so this... this could actually happen if this situation were going on, but... I've already way suspended my disbelief for this movie. Because I'm like, it was almost like we're supposed to think, oh, this is a real investigation. No, this guy is stupid. He's mm-hmm. not a cop. He is, this right. is a joke. Oh. And then he's trying to dig really hard, like, man, I have to get this collar. This guy is stupid. He's insane. Right. Why are you still friends with him? Oh, by the way, they don't know how... Video games are made? Yes. <laughs> I, I knew I knew you were going to have a problem with oh, that. Oh, my God. Those yeah, scenes Justin, were like, the, uh, seriously? The Damon Wayans character works oh. for... A video game company. Oh my god, now I know why. Making video games. That's another reason why. The guy is supposed to know how to make a video game, and he's making a video game based on a cop, and he doesn't know anything about cops. That is true. Massive plot hole. I'm yeah, sorry, that was true. like, really? You're sick. Oh. That's how they got the costumes, Joe, you see. Yes, he got the he got he somehow, the costumes he got, to make the video game. He somehow got access to the the real Kevlar, but didn't understand the code that his dumb buddy, who has no job, <laughs> took the time. He knows. I'm binging on YouTube. Oh my god, it was so stupid. Well, you can learn a lot from YouTube videos, so I'll oh, give yes him that. You can. But the I'll point, give him but that, the point right. is, Dame Wayne should have known that months ago. Yes, yeah. Yeah. he's been developing this game for a while. Though, how he got back into the end was pretty cool. I agree. That was a good scene. That was another, good. That was another a good big segue. suspension of disbelief moment. But yes, exactly. Like I'm saying, that's but that's. I cool. think I think any broad comedy like this is going to have a few. Well, 
suspension no, of disbelief I, moments. I, I don't mind that. You know? But once again, even in something like the Jump Street movies, right. they're ridiculous, incompetent cops, but they are still cops. I agree. They can still they still have training. They mm. still made it. These guys are goofballs. And yeah. the situation keeps getting to the point where you don't think that it would even work anymore. Mm-hmm. And then they try to t- make us take it seriously. Yeah, that, that's the part that I really didn't like. Other than, I also didn't like, in the middle, they kept introducing more frustratingly annoying characters as it went along. The uh, Natasha Legero character um, in the apartment, the, the sex-crazed woman, she was just ridiculous and not funny. <laughs> I don't know what was up with her. There was like, this is just creepy. You know? Mm-hmm. No, in, in all fairness, uh, I did think that if they had decided to do a more serious story, mm-hmm. that their investigation was okay... Like the mobster guy, the, the Russian guy. I would have been okay with he, that. He was threatening. Andy yeah. Garcia was decent. Like, I didn't mind that angle if they wanted to make a serious movie. But right. this was not the movie for it. So, yeah. I'm, so I'm like, and I hate that. It's like, um, many ways, Dying West again. I didn't mind the mm-hmm. real Western stuff, but then the comedy was distracting from it. <laughs> Decide what movie you want to make. I completely agree with I that. Just, I mean, like, yeah. so really, whoever did those liked his, his crime thrillers. But mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny. You know, this was supposed to be like the summer of R-rated comedies. We've had so many. And really, only two have been any good. Twenty Two Jump Street and Neighbors. Mm. All the other ones have been negative, or at least million ways to die borderline for all three of us. Pretty much, yeah. So that's that's kind of a shame. Uh, all right. Well, up next is I Origins, and Justin has that million dollar I. Everything's being set in <laughs> India this summer. It really is. This is a film that's hard to grade because the first half of the film and the second half of the film feel like two entirely different movies. These movies aren't necessarily bad but they don't quite gel as much as they should. The first of these stories is more character-driven and focuses on the two clashing religious standpoints in which neither is is necessarily able to compromise, but trying to for the sake of maintaining a relationship. It has a great deal of potential, but it takes a long time to get going, and the dramatic beats are often delivered awkwardly. For example, when Ian first meets Sophie at a costume party, it just comes off very awkward and doesn't quite mesh. The second half of the story deals more with the initial clashing viewpoints themselves, ultimately posing the question of whether or not spirituality disproves science, or vice versa, in a given circumstance. The segment is significantly more engaging, but unfortunately very poorly acted in spots, alongside that the conclusion poses more questions than answers, which may have been the point of the story, but it just seems a bit weak. Eye Origins is an interesting concept that only really gets to flourish in about half of the overall film, and I give it a C. This I Origins is a movie awash with half-cooked concepts and useless elements. The most interesting part about it, the matching eye thing, doesn't even start really until halfway through, like Justin mentioned, completely different movie from the first half. And even from there, the journey is plot hole written. The acting by relative newcomers is good, and the main points the film tries to address are interesting. But so much goes wrong with this film, it's almost hard to take it seriously. It barely addresses the issue of science versus religion, and there's a lot of things like that that just sort of go nowhere. Ian sees the number 11 everywhere for like three minutes, and then it leads him to this girl, the girl Justin mentioned, who ends up being crucial to the plot, but since he met the girl the scene before at a party, why even bother with all of that? Just have that story continue. I Origins is full of that sort of stuff with no real meat behind it, but it isn't boring. So for that, I give it a C-. minus. Joe? I Origins has some really interesting ideas and some good performances and some really good cinematography, particularly with the eyes. Like the grandeur of the story, I, I really enjoyed particularly the whole classic science versus faith conflict and the eventual melding of them to coming together, but the characters in the plot require many massive benefits of doubt, some dialogue is really kind of questionable, and some of the actions of the characters are really poorly explained, and they aren't believable in the slightest. Still, overall, I thought it was a relatively enjoyable film, and I also give it a C-. Like, I really wanted to like this movie, because I like the ideas, and I really liked some of the shots, and I did think the performances were good. But in terms of the basic writing, particularly, as I said before, just kind of expanding on that, some of the dialogue, which Dan could probably attest to, and just, oh, some, yeah. and just some of the actions, like, this is not how people act. No. <laughs> it's just not. I mean, it's just... And that's the problem that really takes you out of the movie. It's just those basic things. And if it doesn't have this basic groundwork to work off of, this foundation, you can't really work on these bigger ideas, which, 
themselves are only really half worked on anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was my exact problem with it. And the second act of the movie, I mean, you guys mentioned the beginning and the second, but really the first act is more the character-driven part, and then the third act is the journey to actually kind of recover the spirituality. Yeah. But the middle is really this weird investigation where they try to alter the science and make the connection between the eyes, mm-hmm. and that's where like the huge leaps start going. Like When everything was like this happens to be type circumstance like his buddy they're they're driving down the the road in idaho you know and all of a sudden they get to the exact right place how convenient and find out about the exact right person yeah too many of those he goes to india without any more knowledge than the pair of eyes india has a few people in it and he stumbles upon the the home that she was staying at it's like and then his plan which is interesting is to use a billboard to try and get this person to come up with the eyes and then which makes sense that makes sense but it also isn't extremely practical that he gave him one number because in the movie they only show a couple you know rings maybe enough to annoy Mm -hmm. him there are millions and millions of people in india no matter what what. i'm like realistically his phone he should have he should have been on hold. He would have blown up. And, and it's only one billboard, but like he says in the movie, there's a million people in like a 10-mile radius or like, 10 whatever. That's just like, – that was unrealistic in itself. Yeah. I know they tried to show that there was a lot of call volume, but trust me. <laughs> he would. He should have had multiple phones set up. I mean right. he's got enough resources for it. Apparently he can fly to Idaho on a whim, go to India on a mm-hmm. whim. For weeks. I mean, I mean, I know his research was interesting, but I wouldn't say it was groundbreaking at the time. Mm-mm. But I wanted to like it. Yeah, I mean the, the the basic concept and then the larger concepts yes. are mostly pretty good. Like I they're was, just not explored at all. And I mean, I, it's like you said, the ending is supposed to be satisfactory, but it really isn't. I was gonna say, I mean, I get where they were trying to go with the ending, but I feel like it tries to wrap things up, but you have like eight more questions that you wish they had answered before then. To be fair, I think the way they were going before that scene, which wraps everything up, Mm -hmm. would have actually been a braver way to do it, leave it a little more open, but I think they decided audiences wouldn't like that, so they tried to bring more closure and just kind of came off as forced. Yeah. Because I don't even feel like by the end, he necessarily even made that balance between science and No, he definitely didn't. It was just kind of like, okay, maybe science won out. Which was interesting, because they brought it up, they brought that concept up several times in the movie but it's the whole science versus uh, religion thing but it just didn't seem like it really helped his character grow but on joe's favorite laugh out loud line yeah the, the dialogue was bad <laughs> like oh you know it's it's not a real urgent matter but you have to come now yeah <laughs> but get to the doctor today he's like yo they're like what um you're not suspicious right, at all right. it's, like it's a little bit that uh, scene was made me just laugh well, out you loud. laughed out loud in the theater i couldn't which was hilarious because it was so bad it was corny it was so bad yeah it was i minus <laughs> <laughs> that's right i minus <laughs> may as well be your brain uh, uh, all right uh, up next is a step up all in and this is the fifth installment of the step up series it's basically an all-star version without channing tatum of course but many <laughs> i mean he's not coming back but uh, many of the dancers from one or more of the first four Step Ups are here, including Ryan Guzman, Brianna Evigan, and Misha Gabriel. The basic plot is that the dancers, down on their luck and not scoring any dance jobs lately, find out about a VH1 reality contest called The Vortex, in which dance teams will compete for a three-year Vegas gig. Sean, played by Guzman, goes down the chain of previous Step Up participants to get a crew they call Elementrix, who, once put together, competes on the show. This is my first experience with any of the Step Up films, and if this is any indicator, I won't be rushing out to see the others anytime soon. The dancing is solid and the music is great in the film, as you'd expect, though sometimes Elementrix gets completely shown up by another dance crew in the contest, at least in my opinion, yet they continue to move on. I don't necessarily find this a flaw, as when I'm watching America's Got Talent or American Idol, sometimes the act I like best doesn't move on to the next round, so I'll give them that. What I can't overlook is the absolutely atrocious acting from literally everyone in the film. I get that these are dancers, not actors, but at least 2013's Battle of the Year got Chris Brown and Josh Peck, who are at least decent at both. The one girl was so marble-mouthed, it was like her tongue was swelling up more with each line. And at one point, when the crew looked like they weren't going to advance, she says, I can't go back to my crappy phone job. No, you can't. No one can understand what you're saying, so... (laughs) I'm sure they wouldn't have you back. 
that's probably what the, she, they actually fired her. That's why she said that's it. That's right. That's why she's down on her luck. No, no, it's not like I can't. You understand. I cannot do it. They I'm fired from the building. <laughs> I just can't. I have to make this work. Uh, this film would have done better to excise really all the dialogue and just make it about the competition. Although the problem with that is this show, The Vortex, really makes no sense in its execution and also would never be on VH1. Oh my uh, God. So I give All In for the dancing a D+. Plus. Joe, what would you think of Step Up All In? And if I'm not mistaken, are we all completely new to the Step Up franchise? I've seen parts of the first and second one, but I've never watched one all the way. Okay, Justin? I've seen most of three, but still relatively new. I will say this much about Step Up All In. The dancing was good. It really was. Uh, but it does wear thin after about the third time you see it. And I also agree with Dan. The soundtrack was pretty good. But the story is obviously a retread of a retread of a retread. It is super predictable. And with no real depth to make any of the characters interesting at all, I would suggest that you actually hire actors instead of dancers. Dancers dance and actors act. And I give it a D+. Plus. And that's the triple threats. No, not these guys. No, I'm sorry. These people were terrible. Well, here's the thing, though. If you want to see good dancing, what? you can watch one of the reality shows. No. You know, you can watch America's Got Talent. You can watch So You Think You Can Dance and see dance crews, no. and it will be fine. And as I was watching this you know? movie, I'm thinking, I'm comparing it to musicals. I, I'm actually okay. Thinking, okay, there's song and dance in that, obviously, and that has to be good. And I thought the dancing was spectacular in this. I thought the music was really good mm-hmm. in this. But that's it. The yeah. characters are weak. The plot itself yep. is terrible. That vortex thing was stupid. It was, it was the so worst cheap. That constructed that, the host, show. The host was terrible. Yep. She was annoying. The whole plot seemed so unrealistic. And I'm sorry. No offense. But the one character, he's an engineer. And I think they equate well, engineer as like, you know, him with a hard hat means that he's they don't know they don't really obviously know what kind of engineer he is. They just made that up. Oh yeah. His wife says it's okay to do that. No. No, like you, you obvi- it obviously didn't work out before. Mm-hmm. So you're just gonna drop everything and do this to leave your perfectly fine career. It's fine to do it on the side. I'm fine with that. And yes, some people sure, but these people have been doing it for years. Mm-hmm. They're gonna be past their prime soon. Right. I just, I couldn't get take it seriously. Like, well, and none of the characters are compelling at all like you don't really um, like feel for any of them. You don't connect with any of them because they give them no personality I know. character development the, the the best scene or backstory even like we see we see somebody oh he left the, his job and they she took she stole her parents van. she stole <laughs> her aunt's van That's to true. go across the country to do i'm sorry she is a terrible person <laughs> i don't care like I, I i'm sorry like that's what i'm saying all i know about these people is they're selfish mm-hmm. and they're immature yeah i'm yep. sorry i don't my favorite scene actually in the <sighs> whole movie yeah well, I mean, I guess some of the dance competition stuff was good, but at least as part of the characters, yeah. was when the two were at the uh, the amusement park and they were dancing. Mm-hmm. They did their own like routine to the Bobby Brown song. It gave you a little glimpse of actual characterization, and it was a really well choreographed number mm-hmm. that I liked. Other than that, the characters were completely useless to me. Mm-hmm. Justin, let's go to you for step up all in. It's hard to watch Step Up All In and not draw comparisons to the Fast and the Furious franchise. Both have become massive cult hits in their own right, but due to various reasons have kept casting new protagonists to keep the franchise going. However, as time went on for both franchises, they tried to explore the idea of bringing back characters from prior films to create somewhat of a continuous narrative. That said, the key difference here is the Fast and the Furious franchise decided to become sillier but more enjoyable, by guilty pleasure standards anyways, and Step Up, well wants to have fun regardless of whether or not the audience is actually on board. While the dancing sequences are still fun, the storyline is incredibly generic, and in more than a few spots doesn't make much sense. There's about three different romantic subplots going on, four if you count the robot, and <laughs> <laughs> sadly the, the robot was probably the best one, and unfortunately none of them are all that interesting. However, for two hours, the film doesn't drag despite the other major flaws, and I give it a D. I thought this was slightly better than Battle of the Year, I guess, because of the dancing. I liked but Sawyer. Yeah, Battle Sawyer was good in Battle of the Year as the coach. He didn't really do much dancing. He was a good character, though. But not really. He was very generic. But yeah. he but played he was, it all right. He, he, I don't know. Uh, I mean, he, that's, he, that's was, he was more interesting. Maybe it's the well, acting. The, that's the thing. The acting is better in Battle of the Year. 
than it is here, for sure. But, but the dancing's not as good. They're dancing movies, not acting movies. The dancing is better in All uh, In. But that's like so, saying a musical doesn't have to have good acting, just good singing. I agree, True. and I if it didn't have both, I probably would not give it a positive grade. Just yeah. like I mean, these aren't positive grades, but I think if you're watching a dance movie and comparing two, I have to go with the one where the dancing is better. Okay, look. But I mean, at the same time, think about The Raid. Probably not the most groundbreaking acting of our time, but no. really, really excellent action sequences. Mm-hmm. Couldn't you say the same thing? A little bit of story here and there, almost nonstop action. That is an interesting comparison because people are judging something which that movie is more focused on, the action, and to elevate even the story and character development not be as good. But people generally still like the raid, at least. So I, that is a good comparison, well, actually. Well, but there's a lot of action in it. And stylistic this elements, had- too. This had dancing in it, but it wasn't like like the raid is wall to wall action, action almost. Yeah, martial yeah. arts, you know, and very little story focus. This really wants to have a compelling story and just doesn't. That is, I true. think that's the difference. That is true. That's true. You like, know, but then again, if they had done a whole movie just with dancing, it wouldn't really be a movie. It would just be mm. a dance song <laughs> for like twenty. That's well, true. Yeah. that's true, but I guess they could have spent more time in the vortex. When I saw that. That, the first advertisement, like, this is so cheap and mm. bad. Like, yeah. no. Yeah. It was uh, it was just not all in for me. Uh, all right. The <laughs> <laughs> Up next is our home media moment, and that is The Angriest Man in Brooklyn. Joe is going to tell us about that one. The Angriest Man in Brooklyn. A comedy drama film starring Robin Williams, Mia Kunis, Peter Dinklage, and James Earl Jones for a scene. It was directed by Phil Alden Robinson. The film follows a physician, played by Mia Kunis, who tells her obnoxiously angry patient, played by Robin Williams, that he has a brain aneurysm and that he only has 90 minutes to live. This causes the patient to run across the city in an attempt to right his many wrongs and his guilt-ridden doctor's attempts to find him before he actually does die. It's a shame that we have to watch this so soon after Williams passed. While ideas like this have been done before, and some done very well, here, it's a mess. The film's biggest problem is that it has just so many problems. There is a possibility for good humor here and even good drama, but everything is rushed in the 83 minute runtime, with characters literally explaining their motivations as if to convince us that they're not incompetent or just plain nasty. The arcs of the characters are messy as well, as they literally go from being detestable to quasi-salvageable, but then go switching back to their old attitudes anyway. The jokes are mostly just mean, and the tone switches at a neck neck breakingly from scene to scene only dinklage gives a really good performance here but i think that's because he at least knew what his character was the directing was scattershot and the script was very weak overall this film was a poorly paced underdeveloped overacted tonally confused and just unpleasant film even with a runtime this short it felt too long and about 40 minutes in i stopped caring and i give it an f Mm, yeah sounded like it um, yeah, it, it is really such a shame that this turns out to be one of William's final films. For me, uh, I thought the subject matter of his character's death and at one point a suicide attempt is even more like, oh my goodness, you know. And you mentioned off air, um, you know, when we were first talking about this movie, that the director, you know, had maybe mentioned s- some things about how Williams was feeling during the filming of this. I think you can tell. And it shows mm-hmm. because his heart just isn't even in this role. And I mean, and the thing is the lines that he's reading, mm-hmm. like it's not funny. It's not drama. It's just him angry. Yeah. yeah. And it might not be him angry in the subject matter completely. He's just angry in general. I completely he, agree. And, and, you, and it's, it's not, it's obvious. Yeah. And it's, it's sad, but it's like, wow, this well, it, it, it's hard after doing our top 10 Williams performances in our minisode last week and thinking about all these great films over the years to have to watch this one and really just feel bad for him being given such a horrible role. Like I could, it's you a know? horrible movie. It's just bad. A- above that, the script is terrible and hardly believable. Um, I-, I was hoping the character was going to go somewhere, so I-, I can't say I hated watching it as much as you. Um, but since it was released around a time that people are talking about the greatest of William's career, thankfully this one will be universally forgotten, and it's a D for me. Justin? After William's death, I feel like the remainder of his films released this year will leave audiences pondering what state of mind he was in while he was making them. 
The angriest man in Brooklyn is an example of just that. Gone is the Williams charm and warmth that was loved in his earlier work, and in their place is a sometimes amusing in a dark sense, but largely infuriatingly annoying character whose short fuse is meant to be played off for humor and succeeds maybe 20% of the time. Fortunately, the story is fairly well contained given the circumstances, obviously the 90 minute runtime that they keep constantly hitting home, and the supporting cast do offer up some potentially interesting characters, but unfortunately, due to the short running time, none of them are really all that well explored. Nope. That said, I was okay with the actual resolution, and the overall arc is tolerable, but as a whole, much like the other actors that have died this year, this one's also a sad one to leave behind, and I give it a D+. Plus. You know, you make a good point that it's hard not to think after these people pass. We certainly have been doing it with the Hoffman films. What sort of state of mind people were in when they make a movie in their last days. But, you know, I watched this uh, show that he had on CBS, The Crazy Ones, and it really was the old classic Robin Williams that we know and like. The show was not great in the ratings, and that's why it didn't get renewed um, even before his death, but... He was, you know, really hamming it up for the camera and being his Robin Williams self. This is just a bad movie. And I just, I don't think that he saw anything good in it either. I'm not sure why he even did it, to be completely honest. I think he was just trying to make a quick buck, to be you honest know? with you. Yeah. Well, it's, it's possible. Rumor had it that that's the reason he was on the crazy ones in the first place to pay for his second divorce. But Joe, you and I talked briefly earlier today about the James Earl Jones character... Just being, I mean, talk about why is he in this movie. Like, you know, I know what they were going for, and I wanted to kill him. It wasn't funny. Mm -mm, It was just like, this is just annoying. And that's how the whole movie felt. It was frustrating and annoying. Like, this is not funny. I liked the people in it. I just thought the material was horrible. Yeah, Peter Dinklage, you're right, probably gives the best performance here. But we really know nothing about he's his character. Not in it yeah. hardly at all. We just know that they're brothers. And once again, and that they don't get along. Speaking to the terrible writing, it was like, okay, we find out what happens. Oh no, my brother has his aneurysm. Let's go find him. Let's try and find him. Ah, give up. <laughs> yeah, that is true. You know, I, I was just like, wow, you really do care. That's what I'm saying. The characters will start to develop mm-hmm. and they'll go backwards. Like my name's. Oh, you know, uh, I, I love my life, and it just starts being angry again. Yeah. I'm just like stop. And it. the thing with him and his son. Ter- it's just doesn't you know, work. Forgettable. Yeah, Should have taken it out. Of, it's just. Yep. And then they just have to keep hammering. Oh, I lost a son. Oh, you no, know, this is my motivation. I don't even care. You're a horrible <laughs> human being. Like, yeah. Yeah. let's uh, let's go into our top five here and talk about some of the best of Williams. Uh, if you had the chance to listen to our mini sode, which is now up, uh, we each give our individual top ten Williams performances and our top three most underrated performances. So. For the podcast here, uh, we thought we'd do something a little bit different than our typical top fives that uh, we do every week. And I sort of made a a mathematical algorithm here for all of our uh, top tens. And I mean, it's pretty simple. Basically, I took all of our top tens and it's a points-based system. So if if one of us had a movie at number one, I gave it 10 points. If it was at number two, I gave it nine points down the line and if it was number 10 it gets one point so based on that uh we have a top five here and uh we're gonna just you know spend a couple minutes reflecting on uh, each film um there's actually a tie for honorable mention 15 points each for mrs doubtfire and seymour parish from one hour photo both of these characters were on two of our three lists mrs doubtfire was my number one one hour photo was joe's number two really good performances and just the talk about polar opposites. I, I was gonna yeah. say it, it. It's a really great way to look at Williams' career because you have this, you know, c- comedic, hilarious performance from Mrs. Doubt as Mrs. Doubtfire, and uh, we mentioned in the minisode how it also has some heartfelt moments too. And then you have this dark, you know, Seymour Parrish character. Really, it speaks to the range of this man more than I think anyone knew he had in the first even probably decade of his career. You know, he just kept finding new ways to reinvent himself. Um, But number five on our list, all of our top five, by the way, were on all three of our top ten. So these are really, I think, the cream of the crop performances. Uh, Number five earned uh, 16 points from us, and that is Armin Goldman from The Birdcage. We just talked about this movie uh, in depth a couple of weeks ago, 
as an old classic that I had brought. It's uh, one of my favorite Williams performances. Joe, it was the first time you had seen the movie in full anyway. Mm -hmm. Just a great performance. And it's interesting to see Williams as the straight man. You know, everybody's so wild, everybody's so wacky. And he's the voice of reason. Exactly. He's he's probably the least funny of everybody. But he's the center. But he's the center. And he's the most believable, mm. which does make him funny. Yes. Uh, number four, uh, that earned us 19 points with uh, some high rankings from Justin and me specifically, John Keating in Dead Poet Society. He was just truly the heart and soul of this film, I thought. He took bold action, but also knew when to give him the harsh truth of reality. He was, I, th I think he says it beautifully around the third act, suck the marrow out of life, but don't choke on the bone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, it's something that we kind of wish, we wish more teachers would do in, in the educational system today, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, but it also speaks to one thing that I think separates Robin Williams' passing in contrast of uh, all the other celebrities that have passed away this year is the fact that you connected with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was more than just these these characters. You you literally felt like you knew him in these roles. And when, I, I'm not going to speak for either of you two, but when he passed, I, I honestly felt like I lost a friend. I think a lot of people did. I, I mean, I, I I got a little teary when I found out. Like I, I, it took me a second to believe it because I had to look it up and I was like, that's mm -hmm. just... It took me a day or two to really actually come to grips with it. I actually yeah. cried on two different occasions about it. Same. And it wasn't it wasn't the night of. You're right. It took me a little bit to process it. And it was actually as I was looking, the first time anyway, it was as I was looking at the celebrity tweets from the hundreds of people that had either knew him, worked with him, or were affected by his work and are just famous. And to read some of those people's words, uh, especially people who, who I admire, like a Sally Field, so torn up about it. And, and the thing about Robin Williams... Like Justin said, more than probably any other celebrity this year or in most years, is that he was known to everyone. Young, old, comedy fans, drama fans. Everybody knew Rob Williams and had a connection with probably several of his movies. Mm. You know? And, and I think that's, other than the fact that it was sudden, um, is, is what really hit home about it. And, uh, and the character Keating in Dead Poet Society is really a, a true example of how powerful he could be while still being supporting as character. human yeah. as, as, and a supporting character. You're right, Joe. We talked about this in the minisode that when he's not in the movie... It suffers. It suffers. He's not in every scene. He is a supporting character. And yet... When people think of Dead Poet Society... The only person... I didn't... You know, Ethan Hawke... No, you know? really. People, oh, yeah. if people remember anything about the movie, they remember his speeches. Absolutely, that's what they remember. You know, or or even just some of his lines. You know, seize the day, oh captain, my captain. I mean, like or these are my personal favorite excrement. <laughs> that's true. You know, I mean, it, these are lines that are indelible when you think about dramatic film in the last twenty five years. On the list of uh, the film fanatics. Top five Williams performances is the genie from Aladdin. Joe, do you want to speak to that? You know, really, it doesn't surprise me that it would be up there. I mean, if you're talking about a film that I think even just by itself would connect to younger audiences as well as older ones. I mean, Aladdin was just a great film in general, but a lot of people would argue what really elevated that film even further to greatness probably was the genie. And I think particularly what that speaks to for that connection on a deep personal level is how dynamic he was, how funny he was. And how much genius he really had, because most of those lines, as we've said, were completely improv. Mm -hmm. He just had fun with the role, got into the character, and just made him so lovable. I mean, that is one of the defining elements, once again, in a different way. Dead Poet Society, when you think of Aladdin, do you think of Aladdin first? No. no. You think of the big blue genie, you think of Robin yeah. Williams. He changed the game, and one of the best voice acting roles I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Really. What I really like about the genie, in contrast of almost any other Disney sidekick role is he completely shattered the idea that they have to be these cute, adorable, sh spout one-liners here and there. No, he really added an interesting perspective that everybody loved. Adults mm -hmm. could get a kick out of him. Kids loved him. Mm -hmm. You can't find anyone out there who doesn't love the genie. Well, and for most kids, and I, I would assume you guys are probably in this age range because this came out when you were very young, mm -hmm. this was the first exposure to Robin Williams. 
much like how, you know, kids watching Toy Story for the first time at age five, that's their first exposure to Tom Hanks or Tim Allen. Mm, I mean, exactly. you know, when you think of Robin Williams, that's one of the first things probably that that you would think about. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And, and as a first introduction. Uh, introduction, yeah, as an introduction to Robin Williams, that must be just earth shattering that he's so funny, so frantic, so, you know, like you don't even have words for it at that age. But yet, you know, this is something special. Uh, number two was Adrian Cronauer from Good Morning Vietnam. This is certainly one of my favorite Williams performances. I had this at number two on my list as well. And it just, again, you know, you'll, you'll notice in really all of these top five, maybe not Dead Poet Society, but uh, at least in the other four, a lot of improving and ad-libbing going in to these performances. And Good Morning Vietnam, for me, is his ad-lib masterpiece. He was so quick uh, with not only the comedy, but all of these references. And, you know, it's a period piece set in the 60s. Robin Williams had to be accurate also with the kinds of things he was saying and the, the celebrity references he was making. And all of it just came out so fast and furiously. And it's all funny. You know, you totally can see why, okay, the troops love this guy. You know, he is a famous DJ, you know, and, and he's based on a real character, which I didn't actually know until he passed and I was reading up on it a little bit. But I, I can't imagine, no offense to the real Adrian Cronauer, but he ain't no Robin Williams, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's, it's just such a great performance, uh, and I, I would love to have a more in-depth conversation about this. Maybe I'll run it for an old classic at some point. But certainly it, it deserved him that uh, first nomination for Best Actor. Absolutely. He's, he's just great. And, and you guys both pointed out in the minisode how great his character arc is and how well he goes from comedy to drama. You know, and I think that's kind of why it's sort of the definitive Robin Williams performance because you actually get to see both sides of him and that truly human character people can connect with in the same movie, in the same role, that simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, and I think another reason why it would rank so high is because, for a lot of people, it was the first real introduction to what Robin Williams could really do. Right. Uh, but what I think is really good about this role, and what makes it stand out from a lot of other uh, dramatic performances from Robin Williams, is the comedy portions of the film never underplay the, the actual dr dramatic component. Um, all right, well, and number one... Should be no surprise, you guys both had it at number one on your individual list. It was my number three, and that is Sean McGuire from Good Will Hunting. Robin Williams' Oscar-winning performance, finally, huh. in uh, the supporting role. Joe, do you want to talk about that? I mean, if there's an Oscar award to give him, it was this one. I think, I don't know if I'd say it's my personal favorite. I've always liked Cy. I, I was right, like that, <laughs> that darker side of Williams, I guess. But no, I mean, just in pure terms of drama, I guess I'm more of a drama person than a comedic person, mm -hmm. generally. It's what impresses me more, I suppose. So I think this was the first time I'd ever seen Robin Williams really detach himself from the comedy almost completely. Right. And really delve into this really dramatic role. Once again, as a supporting character. But I would argue, once again, he elevates the film. And he's mm -hmm. the center of the film. When people think of Google Hunting, I'd be willing to bet more people think about his character than Matt Damon's character. Well, it's funny. On the DVD box, and this is... Not any sort of re-release. I mean, this was the from the original DVD cover. He's listed first. Of course. I mean, he had won the award, I guess, by that point. But he's listed first because you're absolutely right. That's what people remember about that movie. They remember, they remember that they, character. They remember the scenes. They mm -hmm. remember him, you know, yelling at this kid, speaking softly to this kid, and just having conversations. And that is the real, true human component of Rob Williams that we like. Mm -hmm. Just him talking to us like a friend. And I think that for everybody, a lot of people that felt so upset about him passing because he was that friend. Mm -hmm. And I think few other films probably show that as clearly as this one does. Literally being a mentor, someone to look up to, somebody with some fun, some sense of humor, and a lot of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And just that diverse character, that complicated of a character, is just a really, really strong performance. Well, And, and you're right. We all sort of, as, as a world, really, adopted him as our de facto teacher, mentor, father, and... The, the the Maguire character really has a lot to do with that, I think. Look at Just the list. Friend. 
Well, that That's is it. true. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, or as a good <laughs> as a good friend, you're right. I mean, that that runs the gamut. You know, the birdcage, father figure, dead poet society, teacher, Aladdin, friend, Good Morning Vietnam. You know, your your voice on the radio that that you hear and relate to, and Sean McGuire is the great mentor. He's there to lift you no matter what. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And uh, and I didn't realize this until the minisode either. When you mentioned it, Joe, that a lot of the the Goodwill Hunting stuff was ad libbed as well yep. by him. I actually found that out before the show. I was like, "That's really interesting." Yeah, I, mean, I certainly never knew that. Even probably from Damon as well. Um, I mean, there was a big, big chunk of Saving Private Ryan. He completely ad libbed. Mm. So, well, that's not surprising since Matt Damon co-wrote Good Will Hunting. Right. You know, that he right. would be able to know the character well enough to adapt in right. that movie But that anyway. just shows how raw and natural their conversation really was. Yeah. And brings it to a whole new level, which is why I like it. Robin Williams, is, Robin Williams' character in the movie, Sean McGuire, is just so well written, has mm-hmm. so many layers that you get, you really get pulled into him. Mm-hmm. Yep. It spoke a lot to personal experiences for me. Mm-hmm. You know, pe- people like there, I've had some, some Sean McGuire's in my life. So, Robin Williams. And that's that great. There. I, I think everybody should. And I think you know oh, yeah. if you're watching a film, you know a lot of times it's to learn something, to grow, to share an experience mm-hmm. through Matt Damon's character, be taught something. And I think a lot of people probably came away with some valuable life lessons from Ron Williams. And a lot of I it, think so too. Maybe not just from the script. Some of it ad libbed from him, so it, it's very direct. Yeah. yeah, that's that's true. It's definitely one of the strengths of that uh, character and that film as a whole. Uh, and if you have yet to listen to uh, our mini so to hear our individual top ten lists. Uh, that is uh, up right now. It's it's really, hopefully, uh, a, a fitting tribute for the man that you know. Really, no amount of time would be <laughs> enough to uh, to cover his legacy. But uh, we do have to move on here. So let's do that with our triple feature of older films, and we start that out with the Born Legacy. Directed by Tony Gilroy, 2012's Born Legacy is the fourth film in the franchise and the first to not feature Matt Damon as Born. In fact, nobody in this film is called Bourne. Jeremy Renner plays Aaron Cross. There are references to Damon's character in the film, and Cross is basically in the same boat as Bourne, as he learns, in that he's part of a secret government operation in which the subjects are genetically modified to enhance physical and mental abilities. When word gets out about the program, the CIA attempts to eliminate all of the subjects, leaving Cross on the chopping block. While on the run, he contacts Dr. Marta Shearing, played by Rachel Weisz, who agrees to help him and becomes a target herself. I've only seen the original Bourne trilogy once, and since this was my second time through this one, this is the one I'm actually most familiar with, but that doesn't mean I've forgotten how good the other ones are and how good Damon's character was. Still, this is a very valid entry into the series. It's not the worst Bourne movie, and certainly not the best, but Renner is fantastic as an action lead, and this is the film that really made it clear to me how much I liked him as an actor. It has a slow build, but in a good way, as I was interested in unraveling the story as it went along. It's still a bit odd to call it a Bourne movie without that character in it, and sometimes it tries too hard to shoehorn in the references, but it's intelligent and fun, and I give it a B plus. Joe, what do you think of the Bourne legacy? Uh, I liked the plot and the conspiracy angle. I think it's a decent addition to the story. And admittedly, I do kind of miss Matt Damon's character as well. I think that was kind of the strongest point, obviously, with Bourne. And it really does take a while to get going. I think there are some pacing issues. But for the most part, you are pretty engaged in the story. And once you get to the action, you really feel like it pays off there. I think the climax is really fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, It does feel like a continuation, but with a lot of questions you can kind of add on to as it goes. And with such a runtime like that, it does feel like there have been some things that could have been cut out or maybe added in to make it a stronger film. Still, though, it's an enjoyable addition, and once again, I agree, really strong performance from Jeremy Renner. This guy can hold the film, Mm -hmm. if you didn't think so already, and, you know, I'd love to see the franchise go continue with him, as cross. I mean, I think it's just easily the best thing about the movie. It's his character, how well he gets into it, and it's just very interesting, and wanting to see him follow and succeed, I give it a B. Mm, Nice. Yeah, he's very engaging in in the lead role. He really is, Mm -hmm. and... uh... Hopefully he'll get more projects like that to, to showcase. You're the comic book guy, Joe. Do you think that there could be a Hawkeye spinoff to the Avengers series starring Renner? Um, no. Okay. Uh, I think there could be a Hawkeye Black Widow movie. Okay. Uh, Hawkeye... Makes sense. Jeremy Renner is a great 
actor, uh, Hawkeye is not interesting enough of a character to sustain, I think, a whole franchise by himself. Okay. I guess that's more what I was asking. Yes. Uh, yes, because, you know, honestly, even his comics don't do very well, generally. Okay. He's a good supporting character. Uh, but if they made a, a film where he was one of the main characters, you know, with Black Widow, maybe another S.H.I.E.L.D.-related movie mm-hmm. with Nick Fury, I think it would be great. Because I did want to see more of him in the Avengers. I, I, oh, definitely. No, I liked him and because they have just improved upon it and really have picked a great actor to cast in it they yeah. could, i'm sure we'll see more of him he'll have a bigger part i do think he definitely deserves to have a film that's more his own but just a solid pop would film, not work even with runner no i i highly doubt it okay justin what do you think of that i feel it can happen but we need more build up to it for example black widow got introduced to the marvel cinematic universe with iron man 2 mm-hmm. and basically was a guest appearance didn't think she could carry her own movie even though they kept hinting at it same deal with nick fury but over time, we had the Avengers. We had all these other things that where they tied in. Eventually, Black Widow got a big part in Captain America the Winter Soldier alongside Nick Fury. And now I'm honestly okay which with Which she was great in. Which she was. Yeah. And now I feel okay with the fact that like if they wanted to give them their own individual movies for Phase 3, I'd be all on board. So you'd be up for a Hawkeye movie. I would be up for a Hawkeye uh, movie, but they need to give him a bigger role well, in another movie as, um, as sort of a springboard. Okay. Well... Before they do a Hawkeye movie, they should do another Hulk movie. <laughs> and, as a good intro to actually build up Hawkeye's character, one of the people that teams up the most with the Hulk and Avengers is Hawkeye. They actually have kind of a fun there relationship. That could be a good way to segue him in. Also, a Hawkeye movie would be very difficult to pull off because the man has no interesting villains. His comics mm. suck, generally. Uh, Alright, well let's bring it back to The Born Legacy and hear from Justin on that film. A great reboot respects its source material, but finds a way to be its own movie. And that's what made The Bourne Legacy such a pleasant surprise in 2012. Granted, Renner's no Matt Damon, though he's not trying to be. Whoa! But he provides an original character that keeps the story entertaining, suspenseful, and even sneaking in an occasional funny bit here and there. Yes, these movies can actually be, be both fun and serious at the exact same time, something I wish Paul Greengrass had taken note of. That said, the narrative's a bit hard to follow at time, with twists and turns at every corner, but thanks to the dedication of Jeremy Renner and Rachel Weisz, the film mostly stays lively. Although it does feel like 10 minutes or so could have been easily excised, The Bourne Legacy manages to be a smart new direction for the franchise, and I give it a B. Yeah, it's a little long. This is pretty intense, though. This is now two compliments Justin has given Matt Damon in like a 10-minute span. This is like monumental, man. What happened? But then he brought it back around by hating on Greengrass again. So then I was well, like, okay, Justin's back. Because Greengrass screwed got up the it. franchise. <laughs> yes, I know, and you <laughs> remind us constantly. Um, but so you, you don't have a problem with Matt Damon uh, now. It seems like as, you don't. Because you Bourne, used to not really like it when Bourne, we started the show. Bourne, okay. was, Bourne was kind of like the... Between Good Will Hunting and this. The end of the end. Yeah. It was like, okay, Doug Lyman came on for Bourne Identity. Bourne mm-hmm. Identity was both serious and a lot of fun, much like this. And then came the Bourne Supremacy, which is... As far as I'm concerned, the Temple of Doom of the Bourne franchise. It's just so mean, man. Temple of Doom's not that bad. A lot of people like Temple of Doom. Yeah. A lot of people do like Temple of Doom, but Crystal it's... Skull people hate. Generally. I didn't want to be that mean. Whoa. All right. Okay. And so then cool. Ultimatum, I mean, I still don't think it was the right balance, but I feel like it at least was a push to try and give like the same general sense of action and thrills. I think with the Bourne franchise in general, I think people generally seem to like all the movies at least from my experience people are pretty yeah you only really like the first one then i guess from what i can understand yeah and well born identity was an a born supremacy was a c minus and then born ultimatum was was an a minus i do agree that two is the worst of the four i think it's boring yeah the only one that i can really say is boring but i thought that there was a lot of story in the second one that you kind of needed so have you ever read the second book to be fair no the entire franchise has taken a lot of liberties with this with the source material. I know that, <laughs> which which is understandable given the fact that it's pretty dated. Seventies, yeah. But the first one was at least trying to follow like the basic outline of the first book. Mm. The second movie, the main girl from the first movie, is a huge deal in the second book, and they kill her off in the first ten minutes of the of the second movie. That's a change, and completely go in a different direction, hmm. which is nowhere near as compelling. But then three tries to like balance action and story, which I honestly liked, and I thought it was a lot, a lot better. I still think Greengrass took the franchise way too seriously, but I don't know. I always kind of got the impression that Bourne was a pretty serious story. Have you, you know, ever seen the original films? I, they portrayed it pretty seriously. I have not seen the original miniseries, no. Okay. But I, I feel like 
the formula to creating a great action thriller that will make money is knowing when you're to have a serious concept, but also to have fun with it. Hmm. Like, take for example in this. Yes, it's a very dark, suspenseful storyline. There are still a couple entertaining bits. Uh, I mean, there's a little bit of light comedy, but uh, it's a pretty intense movie, I would say, overall. I always thought the material was supposed to be serious. Yeah, like what they I, did I would, to Bourne and I whatnot. think the Bourne series, I mean, granted, of course, I haven't read the books either, but from what I've seen, does seem to be one of the more serious leaning of these sort of... More serious than your events. average James Bond movie. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, you don't really have to expand on it. Have you ever seen any of the Jack Ryan movies? I've if you're seen, thinking about fun, those movies yeah. are pretty serious, and there are people couple, there like, are a couple moments in Hunt for Red October. They're pretty serious. I haven't seen Patriot Games, Clear and Present Danger, and Some of All Fears. I've heard some is terrible. I like them all. Yes, you do. And there is some fun. And Shadow Recruit, even. And yes, Recruit. I like all the which, Jack Ryan yeah. movies. Which does, even though I, I but, would argue that one is also taken you know, deadly seriously. Not compared to this. I, no, I think that one was a lot more fun than. I this think one. that was a lot lighter. In, in its general tone. No matter if you think you're so clever, perhaps you're just rude. <laughs> this yeah. is my serious evil villain. Really, no. It, it was, there was a and whole then, And then the bits where she was at dinner with, with Kenneth Branagh. I, I think this is much more serious. I mean, yes, you're not wrong, Justin. There's a few lighter moments. You gotta have your but lines. But it's typically... Like the scene where the guy I, murders I think everybody? I a heavier, a darker movie. The, the hard, yeah. like, suicide assassin thing? That's pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, it is. But I feel like there's a time and a place for everything. And I think some movies can just take themselves seriously. All right. Well, uh, let's let's move on here to Sin City. We'll be talking about uh, the new one of that uh, next week. This one I had not seen. So in preparation for A Dame to Kill for next week, since we had an extra slot this month for Old Classic, the three of us already went, and Listener's Choice will be next week, we agreed to run this one. And Joe's going to tell us about Sin City. Sin City is a 2005 neo-noir action thriller based on the graphic novels by Frank Miller, author of influential works such as The Dark Knight Returns, as well as 300. It was directed by Miller himself, as well as Robert Rodriguez, and stars many great people, including Mickey Rourke, Bruce Willis, Clive Owen, Rosario Dawson, Michael Clark Duncan, Brittany Murphy, and Elijah Wood, among many others. It is an anthology following several of Miller's stories. These stories are The Hard Goodbye, in which Marv, played by Mickey Rourke, is a man with a dark past going in search of a murderer of a prostitute he loved named Goldie, tearing away through the underworld to uncover a conspiracy, The Big Fat Kill, which focuses on a street war between a gang of prostitutes and the mob, as well as That Yellow Bastard, in which an aging cop, Hardigan, played by Bruce Willis, goes on a final mission to protect a young woman from a psychotic killer. The film was a critical and commercial success, most famous for being a very faithful comic book adaption, with excellent rendering in black and white environment to make certain colors stand out, much like the comics. This is a comic book film, so naturally I have an interest. Compiled with the noir and complex characters and the crime background, I have to say that I thoroughly enjoy it. It is ranked as one of my favorite films of all time. I think that the actors for the most part do a good job, and the script really is very faithful. It helps having an author close at hand to bring the books to life. As far as the stories go, The Hard Goodbye is definitely the strongest, with work giving the best performance, bringing the most popular character to life. Really, everyone does a good job. Owen does well with his role, as does Willis. I think that the supporting characters also shine as well, with many great standouts. I don't really have too much negative really to say. I will admit that the film does contain certain exploitative elements, such as heavy violence and dark humor. The tone is also very noir-based and over-the-top, but then again, that's how the comics typically were, so I can't really fault it for that. There were some miscasts, though, most notably Jessica Alba being the weak link, but passable enough, I suppose. It might not be for everyone, but if you like comics or just noir-style storytelling, you'll find some enjoyment, and I give it an A. All right, Justin, what'd you think of Sin City? Sin City is a film that truly could have been so much worse in the hands of an incapable director. Yes, there's plenty of pulpy action, and it's slightly over two-hour running time to draw audiences in, but finding someone who can bring the look and feel front and center and truly emphasize the seemingly endless number of interesting characters who embody Basin City is imperative. Fortunately, Robert Rodriguez was the right man for the job, bringing all the chaotic action he's known for seamlessly fused with co-director and creator Frank Miller's hard-boiled noir stories. Each story has its own attitude, and the traditional film noir voiceover, paired with an absolutely gorgeous replication of the black and white comic book, is fantastic. Although it can get a bit tiring near the halfway point, the amount of creativity, both stylistically 
and telling the story out of chronological order narrative is something to admire. It's a film with near instant replay value to appreciate the editing in- intricacies that went into it, and I also give it an A. Well, what struck me the most about Sin City, and again, this was my first time watching it, but it's how brilliant the cinematography is and how crisp the black and white looks. It grabs you right from the start and takes hold the whole film, punctuated with the sharp color every now and then in somebody's eyes or blood splatter. And speaking of which, is it way too violent for my own tastes? Absolutely. But it's very artistic in its nature, and though gratuitous at times, its intensity does ring true for the characters. The story is fun, and at times even funny, amidst the action. Everyone looks like they're having a good time, and performances are enhanced because of that. It allows the audience to be okay laughing at some hideous things. Joe, you mentioned how it really is a dark comedy. Yeah. It it certainly imparts. And that's because the actors play it off partially tongue-in-cheek. It's easy to see why this is a cult favorite of many, and I as well give it an A. Oh. Jessica Alba, notwithstanding, she's terrible in everything. It would be an A-plus without some her lines. Honestly, that's yeah. probably true. <laughs> she's really not good. But everybody else, you're right. I mean, even even Alexis Bledel, who you might know from the Gilmore Girls or Sisterhood of the Pants. She was fine. She, was, she did a really good job here mm-hmm. with this more meaty character, a little darker you know, role for her. She did fine with it. Mm-hmm. How'd you guys feel about uh, Josh Hartnett as, as the bookend of the film? Well, character-wise, it was fine. Who's he, bullets and more, yeah. Yeah, I mean, here again, I don't particularly think he's a good actor, and I don't know if he was the best one for the part. He but, worked well in the two scenes he was in. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. he wasn't in it really long enough to care. Like, so. they mentioned in the synopsis as a short story, but it's it's just a cool opening to set the scene and to end it. Mm-hmm. You know, like, it was fine. I really like it, but could he carry a whole movie? I don't know. But no. that I'm actually really surprised. I thought both of you would have had bigger problems with this. I'm really surprised at you, Dan. I, I thought, loved it. I thought you would have given this like a B. At really? Because I know that you, the violence, the nudity, uh, the just the, uh, not the oh, nudity. I liked the nudity. Not the nudity. I mean, just just the extreme violence. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I thought maybe the narration would have gotten grading or that they would have been too cartoony for you at points. I'm really quite surprised. <laughs> well, here's the and thing, I'm, and impressed by you, Dan. I'm well, thank say. you. I, I aim to impress. It is all of those things that you mentioned, but it's done in a specific way. I, I always sort of go back to Tarantino because that was my first real introduction to super gritty violence. And I love Tarantino. Why that doesn't translate to other directors is mostly in the handling. Mm-hmm. you know. And I think Robert Rodriguez, which, no surprise, huge friend of Tarantino's. Who also you know, helped like, film a little who bit. Who helped film a little bit. I like this style. And the noir setting makes it pop more. The characters are fun. And like I said, everybody's having a good time. And, you know, and Tarantino does this too. I like seeing actors out of their element. Next week, we're going to review The Expendables 3. And it's like, you know, I didn't like The Expendables 2 at all. We'll see how this one goes. But it's all the same people doing their same stuff. What made Pulp Fiction in part so cool is John Travolta was doing something you never would have thought you'd see him do. Mm -hmm. And here you have Elijah Wood eating people. It's it's that dichotomy that you don't typically see that Mm. I really like. And that's what grabs me about these movies that are way violent that I like. Mm. So it's kind of the fact that it was tongue-in-cheek and... I think that helped, yeah. But I'm guessing that just the style overall worked for you. Yeah, it really did. And I think, like you both mentioned, having Miller be so hands-on with it. Well, he'd have to be. It's his baby. It, well, well, yeah. But that's what I mean. But a lot of people just... I mean, look at J.K. Rowling. She didn't co-direct any of the Harry Potter... You know, Which, it's like, she could have. But to have his baby not be in anyone else's hands, maybe offering it up, okay, Rodriguez can, you know, co-direct... He's still doing it, though, you know? He's there. He's there right. every step of the way. And that's why I would argue this is probably the best comic book adaption ever made because the author is doing the movies. Right, right. You know, it, it doesn't... And literally, it's almost frame by frame, panel by panel. And I do think the comics are generally a little darker. There is some of that humor there. But overall, though, the feel, the look, it's just beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's a perfect transition. Well, I'll tell you what, it's... You know, this is a movie that I 
had avoided for years, not specifically like, oh, I don't want to ever watch that, but it just, it didn't seem like something that would be up my alley. And when the new one was coming out, you gentlemen both had it in your top five most anticipated when we did that in December, you know, I was like, well, that's not, you know, I have no real interest in seeing it. I'll watch it for the show. I'm really excited for it now. Honestly, I think I might like the second one more. Yeah? Call the gut feeling. It's possible. I don't know why, but I'm... Ava I'm, Green's on a hot streak, so... I'm really excited, so, you know, I'm... Yeah, I do like Ava Green. I like that this was multiple oh. stories, too. Well, that's that works. You know, I think it does work for it. That's the... Another thing I want to ask you guys. Uh, of the stories, which one was your favorite? Because my personal favorite was always uh, the That Yellow Bastard with which Hardigan. That? Bruce Willis. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah, that was good. Most people would say the hard goodbye, though. Big Fat Kill, usually maybe a toss-up. The hard goodbye is the one with Mickey Rourke, yes. Mm-hmm. But I think you like the Big Fat Kill a lot. I though. probably did like the Big Fat Kill the most. How about you, Justin? Yeah. Upon first viewing, when I originally saw it, it would probably be Hardigan's story. Mm-hmm. But over reflection, reflection, and eventually writing a paper about Sin City, uh-huh. it would probably go to the Big Fat Kill, yeah. Really? So not the hard goodbye? That's like the most famous... Is that the most popular one? Well... I mean, I did like it. That's interesting, because that's like the brunt of the film, and uh, that that is like the center, because mm-hmm. that character, Marv, is the linchpin. Well, that's true. But you know, Joe, here's the thing. It's the rare time where there are multiple stories where you could ask people, you know, which one's their favorite, and you'll get a different answer. I, my perfect example for that is Four Christmases, because I love Reese Witherspoon. Four Christmases could have been a really good movie, but two of the Four Christmases are terrible. Mm. You know, and here you have all of them are A or A-plus worthy, and that speaks volumes, I think, for this movie. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I have to say, uh, that was not as uh, contentious as I thought it was going to be. No. No. Not were you were you gonna fight me on it? You think I wasn't really you gonna fight. To, I just wasn't expecting no. you to like it as much as you did. I'm happy you did though. Good. Well, I'm I'm glad. Uh, all right. Well, moving on. Our final film is Amistad, and that's for our Oscar A to Z. This scored four nominations in 1997. That's for cinematography, costume design, original score, and the one that makes it an A to Z candidate because we only really focus on the major awards, is Best Supporting Actor for Anthony Hopkins. And Justin's going to tell us about Amistad, something that he has mentioned uh, in previous top fives, actually. In 1839, a free citizen turned slave from Cuba named Sinke, played by Jaimin Hansu, led a bloody mutiny against their captors in an attempt to steer their ship towards home, only to discover that their captured navigator led them straight for the authorities. Now, imprisoned as runaway slaves in the United States, it's up to abolitionist lawyer Roger Sherman Baldwin, played by Matthew McConaughey, and his colleagues Theodore Jodson, played by Morgan Freeman, and John Quincy Adams, played by Anthony Hopkins, to prove their innocence and send them home. While much of the more recent work of Spielberg, with the exception of Lincoln, is largely love it or hate it, I've always admired his uncanny ability to find a great story and try to bring it to, to life on the big screen. Amistad's unlike any project that he had done at the time, and as such, I really have no problem calling it one of his edgiest movies. Spielberg took on the disgusting nature of slavery through the through the lens of a courtroom drama, and while the film may run a bit long, it never truly manages to drag. Admittedly, some of the courtroom scenes get a bit repetitive in how they play out, but with great performances, notably from the triple threat of McConaughey, Freeman, and Hopkins, this largely can be overlooked. As a result, the fight for the slave's freedom becomes intense and powerful, ultimately culminating in arguably one of Hopkins' greatest movie moments. Although the epilogue is a little bittersweet, the film as a whole is truly one of Spielberg's most underrated films, and I give it an A. Justin, I have to disagree with you on the pacing. This one started out really slowly for me. I think we were about a half hour in before I I got invested with anything going on. Like most Spielberg films, it goes on a bit long in general, so it's not entirely surprising, but most of them at least grab you before that. There are some really good performances here, as you mentioned, um, with some veterans that you'd expect, like Freeman and Hopkins, plus some great character actors, and one of the great early McConaughey performances. Between a great story, some gritty realism involving the slave trade, and solid performances... It's a good movie, just the length and the pacing really drag it down. For me, it's the kind of movie I don't ever need to see again, but it's certainly worth the first watch, and I give it a B. Joe? 
Uh, Amistad is, I would agree, also one of Spielberg's more underrated films. I think that the key thing for me that I love about this film was just the dynamic between McConaughey's performance and his character as well as Hansu's. I think that their relationship is really the crux of this movie, and I think that both actors give great performances. I think that mm-hmm. Hansu shows early on what great talent he has. I think he was getting really big at one point, kind of a rising star, and then he just kind of fades in and out now mm-hmm. people know who he is but yeah blood diamond was kind of his peak yeah, i would say it just seems Truly. like he's mm-hmm. kind of i don't know I, just, I don't i don't know if people appreciate him or not i i never really can tell but in, in other words i do think that overall the cast was really good one thing that kind of bugged me about the movie was that morgan freeman felt like he was superfluous mm-hmm. like i'm i'm sorry he gives a good performance he gives a good but... performance but his character is unnecessary and his scenes are unnecessary it's just weird because it seems like there's some scenes where his character seems to be going more further than he is, uh-huh. and then sometimes they'll just like fall a little bit short. My my problem with it is I, I like some of the scenes he has with the printing press and everything, but the problem is this: there are three or four characters that are the Morgan Freeman character. Mm-hmm. There are a couple abolitionists that say the same thing, and you're just like, okay, we want to put the face of a successful black man in the 1830s. Maybe it's really what happened, but I just felt like his character was so underdeveloped. He could have easily brought him out of the movie; it would have been fine. So that that did was a minor thing that bugged me. Other than that, though, I really don't have any problem with Amistad. I thought that the I really like the set design. I love the costumes. I think it really does a good setting. The period and the cinematography is gorgeous. The cinematography is yeah. gorgeous. I love sure. the acting, the music. I mean, it's Spielberg. He creates epics. Mm-hmm. Hopkins gives not one of my favorites, but a really good performance as usual. Uh, McConaughey is great as a lawyer. Yeah, I mean, really, of I, course. <laughs> I actually, I actually really like the courtroom drama. Uh, Justin, I disagree with you. It does get repetitious, but that's because in the actual story, they had to keep proving the same case over and over again uh, to that's show. What I was trying to get at. Well, I, I understand it, and I can understand why that might be a pacing issue too, Dan. But that's yeah. something, and you can feel their frustration because they even say the movie feels like it should be over. And I, I thought it a couple of times. Well, it's supposed to be, but right. they're not allowing it to be. And I thought that worked. I actually give it an A as well. If it hadn't been for just the superfluous Morgan Freeman character they could have written out, I thought it would have been perfect. I do agree that some of the absolutely strongest scenes were between McConaughey and Hansel. Just their dynamic, getting to know each other and figure out language what to do yeah the, yeah the language barrier like just even the beginning where that there's that scene where he tries to just in the most basic form using pictures to show like this is where we mm-hmm. are where you are show where you came from and yeah. there's this my favorite scene in the movie mccone is trying to draw the picture like okay we're here are you from cuba and he kind of shows ah oh, here's africa you're from here and hansa looks at, at that and just kind of walks away keeps walking 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 into the fog and he's like this is where i'm from to show how far away he feels he mm-hmm. is from home even though we don't ever hear any English dialogue from him there, that's amazing. It speaks volumes. I mean, it's not just the acting. I mean, of course, you know, the shot, the music, perfectly timed, just McConaughey's reaction. Great directing. I mean, just mm-hmm. that scene kind of makes that movie for me. It really that is it's, it is a powerful scene. I'll definitely agree with it's that. It's really good. And yeah, uh, yeah I, I I love that movie. It's really good. I'm I'm glad I saw it again. Didn't like it quite as much as I saw it before, but I think an A from an A plus is, you know. I do see the pacing issues. I can understand that. I do think a B is a little low. It's possible. But, you know, I have to say, I think almost all of Spielberg's movies Too long. are dragged down by the length. Lincoln, I gave an A- minus to because it's just, it's almost three hours. E- E.T. for me is the only one that really threw and through. And, and to be honest, E.T. probably is a little long. Yeah, but little that little. was one of my favorites growing up. So I guess I can forgive it. Uh. But, I mean, even Tintin, which is only about two hours, is a little bit long. He likes to cut over as he can. Yeah, Tintin's a little long, too. Um, so, you know, for me, it's... I love Spielberg. Obviously, he, he's made some of the greatest films of all time. But, but he, he does have a problem with uh, really, trying to do a little too much sometimes. Yeah. And, and varies from movie to movie, but agreed. It feels like he tries to make an epic with every movie. Right. And this, to me, was a little bit worse in that regard than most. Okay. So... But anyway, that is going to wrap up the show for this week. Uh, We have our listener's choice next week. We have uh, a lot of great submissions in, so we're going to do one of those movies. And if you'd like to get an early start for September's listener's choice, you can do that at uh, Film Fanatics 
uh, on Facebook, which is Film Fanatics with an exclamation point, and join up there. Uh, if you have not subscribed to our podcast yet, please go ahead and do that right here on this YouTube channel. Joe, you've got uh, the Merlin channel up and running. Anything new there? Well, uh, Obviously a Sin City uh, Dame to Kill for review there coming up. That'll be coming up. I did review the... Uh old boy remake finally upon the oh, request oh yes yes thank you so, for watching that so uh, yeah i i had some issues with it uh but uh, maybe we can discuss it some other for time sure well that will do it uh, for the show thanks so much for listening and we'll see you back here next week gentlemen happy anniversary happy and anniversary to you, and yeah. uh, to many more so we'll see you next week bye